it's usually around this time that it's either the, the Spirit of God or it's the Red Bull. But it, or some combination of the two. But I, I, I'm excited for the Word of God this morning. I'm excited to, to get back into this series about Jonah. Do you guys remember that we're here for the first two parts of Jonah? We're going into part three, chapter three. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to get into this Word. You know, I, I, I've been sitting on this word for about three weeks now, and I, I've been spending all this time in this text, and, and through Resurrection Sunday and, and the Good Friday services and everything that we had, this word has been sitting in my heart. And I don't know who this is for today. I don't, I don't know what you came in hoping to discover, but I'm going to tell you the title of today's message. It's called, What's the Point? If you got a bulletin when you came in this morning, you should have a little area in the back of your bulletin where you can take notes. I always encourage that you do, because it, it, it might not be for you today, but it could be tomorrow. What, what God is going to speak to you today might not be for what you're going through right this minute, but your next season might bring a new, a new challenge, and this might be what you needed to hear. And I, I, I love you all. I know, I know you memorize like every word of my sermons. But for the ones of us who forget what I say about 10 minutes after you walk out that door, having a paper copy, notes of what God spoke to you is important, okay? So I'm going to encourage you to please use your notes. Um, what's, <laughs> it's a bad time to, to say the, the title again, but what's the point? What's the point? We're reading out of Jonah chapter 3. There's 10 verses. Before we get into that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share, because I, I like to share some of my own, my own faults and my own dysfunctions. I think it allows you to understand that God can use me. There's hope for anybody. And so when I was a seafood manager, I was about 21 years old. I was a seafood manager up in New York. Back when New York was New York. It's no longer New York anymore. But back when I was a seafood manager, uh, I had to learn very quickly how to deal with people and how to be completely honest and, and call things out in the moment. And, and there was this one young man, and, and he was a, a really nice guy. He was. He, he tried his best, but I remember talking to him. And I would ask him to do specific things. I would ask him to, to get a specific task done. And then when I would come in the next day and realize that he did not do it during the evening, I would follow up with a question, hey, what happened to what I asked you to do? Why wasn't it done? And God bless him. This is pre-salvation. But um, I remember thinking, if you start your explanation with, well, I'm going to smack you. Because every single time I would ask him to do something, and he wouldn't get it done. He was started off with the same, well, we had a bunch of people that came in about six o'clock and they all wanted lobsters and I didn't have time to get, to get it done. And, and he would give me a whole list of excuses why he didn't get the task done that I asked him to do. And every single time this would happen, he began the conversation with, well, do you have somebody like that in your life? Like no matter what happens, you ask them a question, and because they didn't do what they're supposed to do, it's followed up with some form of introduction of, well, oh, that, that, I have a great story for you. I don't want a great story. I want you to get to the point on why you didn't do what I asked you to do. And I've learned that this carried over into being a father, because my, my kids had these extravagant, really lavish stories about why they didn't clean their room or why they punched the other one in the eye, or, or why one of them's bleeding. It's never just to the point of, well, I, I hit him because they hit me, and, or I, I, I stabbed her because it hasn't gotten that far yet. But I'm trying to give you an idea of how the extremes of what can happen. They go into these long stories. Well, well, and I discovered this about myself. It's probably not the greatest trait. I think it's, it's because of my lack of patience, is that I, I so badly love to get to the point of the story. Is anybody else like that with me? Like, I, I don't mind a good story. Like, I, again, I love movies. I love reading good books. I love when it's written really well. But there's certain times when I don't want to hear your story. I don't want to hear your excuses. I want to hear the point of the story. And as I'm getting older, I'm realizing my time is extremely valuable. And so, no, I don't have 20 minutes to listen to, and this is, again, please hear me, my, my pastor's heart, like, I love all of you, and nobody here has ever done this, but, but in past seasons, I've had youth, when I was a youth pastor, and they would come up to me and tell me every detail of every moment, of everything that led up to a specific incident where what they thought was going to happen didn't happen. No point to the story at all. But as a good pastor, you sit and you listen and you just you shake your head and you try to remember specific things so you can reiterate what they said to you. I don't do that to you guys. I, I listen to you guys. But 
I learned this trait about me, and that is, I like getting to the to the point of the story. I, I want to know why it happened. I, I, I want to know what led to it. Yes, that's great, but ultimately, what is the revelation that's inside of what you're telling me? And I realized that most of us, when we read the Bible, we don't ever actually try to discover the point. It's almost like we just, we read and we absorb. But do we really dig to understand the, the finite understanding why God has put it in his book? What is the point? That's what I want to challenge you with. What is the point? As we're working through Jonah and, and we're going into chapter 3, I, I gave it this title because I want to tell you what the point is of Jonah. It's four chapters, roughly 48 verses. It's a short book, and by next week, you will all have accomplished reading through a book of the Bible. Praise God. That's awesome. Okay, so that's a, that's a big accomplishment. Not everybody can say that. And so next week, we'll be finished with Jonah. But as we go in, and I'm going to ask you one last time, can you just stand as we read these 10 verses? What's the point? I'm going to tell you the point. Of course, before I do that, I'm going to tell you what's not the point. But Jonah, chapter 3, and most of you are not familiar, if you haven't been here for the past two uh, parts of the series, uh, Jonah is the prophet who God sent or asked him to go to Nineveh to, to tell them that they were basically going to be destroyed or overthrown or overtaken because of their evil lifestyle. And, and Jonah has chosen to go in the opposite direction of where God called him to do. Again, this is none of you. None of you ever do that. I know God tells you to go do something, you do it immediately. But for the rest of us that have hesitated, paused, or made a mistake, or gone in the opposite direction of what God has called us to do, we are like Jonah. And there's a reason why he does this. And, and of course, everybody most famously knows Jonah as the man who was swallowed by a whale or a fish, a sea monster, as it's originally written in the text. But chapter 3, verse 1, and there's different translations, so what you'll be reading is different than mine. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it, this message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city. Proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. I, I, I so badly want to just focus on that verse right there. That the Ninevites believed God. How sometimes just simply believing God will change the paradigms of your future. That you don't have to make any other change in your life but believe God and you will see change in your life. But the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. So many aspects of this text. So many different things that has been happening in the first three chapters of this book. And if we're not focused, we can lose sight of the point. And so, Father, I ask right now that you give us laser-like focus to understand what you are trying to say in this text. More importantly, how it is relevant to us today. How this word translates and how it, it crosses the boundaries of time and relates to us today here in 2022. Father, I ask that you would give us revelation to, to your character in this text, that you would reveal inside us the things that you want us to look at. Father, I ask that you have your way here and now, and that not let me get in the way of you. 
Lord, use me to, to be the megaphone to speak your words. May your will be done. I ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Not for the last time. What's the point? You know, as, as a speaker, as a communicator, somebody who teaches the Bible on a weekly basis, now doing it for almost 10 years now, you know, you start to ask yourself, what is the point? Not, not like, there, there's no meaning, this is hopelessness, I'm not, no, I'm saying, but what is the point to why we teach? What is the point to why we study? What is the point behind why we have the Word of God in our lives in the first place? Why do we come to church? There has to be a point behind it, and, and my goal is that today we would see the bigger point in this picture, and ultimately it would give you more meaning behind how you live your life. And so if you're writing down your notes, and I always suggest that you do, I want to tell you first of all what this is not about, what the point is not, and this is point one, and this is going to get creepy. Point one is not about the whale. Go ahead and write that down. It's not about the whale. It's amazing. Out of 48 verses, only four verses are dedicated to the fish or the whale. And yet, most of us associate Jonah with the beast. It's amazing. In kids' church, I mean, there's, there's countless books written around this, this experience that Jonah had inside the belly of this beast. Cartoons have been written. Pinocchio, I remember Pinocchio being an illustration of being swallowed whole by a whale. And yet it's only four verses out of 48, yet our memory associates it with the fish. And I, I'd like to say this is because maybe we're American. I, I can't speak for every nation and every people, but I know as Americans we're drawn to bigger, better, flashier, quicker, right? I mean, that's, that's where our minds are. It's why advertising is done the way it's done. It's why, it's why marketing spends so much money trying to understand what drives you crazy and what gets you excited. And this is where I told Andy, I was going to use you for an illustration here. My boy Andy over here playing the keys. Raise your hand, Andy. My boy Andy. His favorite drink is Mountain Dew. Dew the Dew, right? Do you guys, the 90s was more famous for Mountain Dew commercials, I would say. This is back when they had like the rock climbers and they're hanging off the cliff like 10,000 feet in the air and they're downing a Mountain Dew or, or when they're skydiving, they're jumping out of the plane and, and as they're diving, you see the can of Mountain Dew floating and they, they capture it. They, they, as they're falling to the ground, they're drinking the Dew. And, and, and it's amazing because that's just an illustration of how marketing plays to using words like amazing, astounding, exciting, and it gets us pumped, right? I mean, is it just me? Have you seen the commercials? They'll have a family playing in the sand on the beach. They'll, they'll have them, they'll have them just, just, just eating ice cream cones and walking along. You see dolphins in the background. This beautiful experience, it brings tears to our eyes, and it turns out it's a commercial for a car. You don't realize it because they don't show the car until the end, and the whole idea is family. Volvo. And that's it. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to get a rise out of our emotions, and hopefully we'll attach it to their product. That's why some of you, and if you notice the algorithm when it comes to Google and, and, and websites, you look for one thing ever in your entire life, and you will be staring at ads for three years, saying this is geared towards you based on your search history. And it's, it's amazing how it works. And, and here's the thing. We associate Jonah with the whale. Jonah with the fish. And what's funny is that the whale actually plays, or the fish plays a bigger part in this story than we give him credit for. Because it's, it's, it's Jonah walking into the city of Nineveh, and he's preaching the word. And it's not a big word. It's not this extravagant word. It's eight words, to be specific. He's speaking these eight words, and we're seeing revival. Why is that happening? Some commentaries believe it's because they knew the story about the miracle of the fish. And so his reputation and the miracle associated with him is preceding him. And so here comes this man who was spit up on the shore, vomited up on the shore by a fish. And he's telling us right now, after being in that belly for three days, that in 40 days God is going to overturn us, overthrow us, we're going to be taken over and destroyed? Yes, I'm going to listen. So the, the fish plays a bigger part in the story than we give him credit, but he is not the point of the story. 
despite what our Sunday school illustrations say, despite what we know about the history of Jonah, it is very small. It's a plot point, but it's not the point. And it's funny how we get so sidetracked by things in our life, that things are extravagant and big, and we assume that that's where God is. That's what God is doing, but oftentimes it's in the small, it's in the common, that's where we find God. And I think that we're overlooking the common, looking for the exceptional, because that's where we think God dwells. And and there are ministries and there are preachers around the world who try to capitalize on the extravagancy of God. When Jesus came back, he was not extravagant, he was common. It's why he was overlooked. And I think that today we're still seeing this. We're overlooking the, the, the beauty of God in his word because we're focusing on the fish. It's not about the miracle. It's not about the healings. It's not, it's not about the, the big extravagant things that so many of us get captured by. It's the commonality of what's happening in the story. And so, yes, point one, it's not about the whale. But here's the thing. He sent to Nineveh, right? First chapter. Jonah, go to Nineveh. No. That's his response. No. Just no. Not going to do it. And, and here's the reason why. He didn't want them to receive a second chance. Jonah's heart was hardened, and he didn't want them to receive an opportunity to be forgiven by God. So if I don't go, they don't hear the destruction is coming, and then God will just destroy them. I'm going to Tarshish. And that's what he does. 2,500 miles in the opposite direction where God has called him. Why? Because he wanted the outcome to be the outcome that he wanted and not what God wanted. You see, Jonah knew the character of God. And he knew that if he went there and preached, what would God do? He'd forgive. Because that's the God that we worship. And so here's point two. I want you to write this down. It's not about Nineveh. Even though the majority of this book is about Jonah, go to Nineveh. No. Jonah, get off the boat, get in the fish, go to Nineveh. Fine. I feel like I'm reading a story about my kids. They're doing it, but because they're being forced to. Like, fine, I I don't want to be in the fish anyway. And and stomping, and, and, and he's going into Nineveh. but There's no excitement behind what he's preaching. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. No, like, like, if you repent, if you turn away from your evil ways, then God won't destroy you. No. It's not even like, hey, God's going to destroy you in 40 days unless you change. He doesn't offer any kind of solution. All he says is, 40 days, you guys are done. 40 days, and you're being overthrown. That's the whole gist of his preaching that he is doing. And yet commentator after commentator, theologian after theologian says there's a great revival that happens because of the power of the words that were spoken by Jonah. Really? Eight words, and that's the power that changed this entire city, this great city, these eight words of if you, well, actually didn't, no, 40 days, and you're done. That's the power that Jonah had no, and that's why I think they say in the scriptures, they believed God. Not that they believed Jonah, they believed God. You see, it's so easy, again, to to look at the context of the scripture and to assume that this whole story is really about how God's grace and God's mercy chased after the Ninevites. That they, that they chose to repent, they chose to mourn because wearing sackcloth and sitting in ashes was a sign of mourning. Of repentance. And here's the best part. Here's what I love. There are commentators who will sit there and say, well, I don't think this was true repentance. Why? Because they didn't worship Yahweh. They didn't worship God. This isn't true repentance. They're afraid that they're going to be destroyed. And and, and here's my rebuttal. Not to them, to you, because most of them are probably dead by now. But here's my rebuttal. If this wasn't true repentance, then why does God forgive them? If this wasn't a sincere gesture of having a turn, a change of heart, why does God forgive? And these commentators are doing the same thing that we most often do when it comes to our faith. We are assuming the condition of other people's hearts based off who they were. They were the the Ninevites, the, the Assyrians. They were vicious, cruel, hostile people, known for their violence around the world. 
Surely they did not have a true change of heart. But according to God's response, yes, they did. And here's what I want to offer you right now. Write this down. Nobody can define your heart but God. Just because your repentance, just because your change of heart doesn't match up with what other people expect it to be, does not define what God is doing inside of you. So yes, you might still struggle with some things, but they don't know what you've been through. And yes, you might still have some dysfunctions and, and coping mechanisms, but guess what? God is still redeeming you through the fire. And so you cannot sit there and have these expectations put on side of you that if you don't look a certain way or sound a certain way, then you're not really true repentant to God and, and you have not received salvation. This is a lie because the response is from God and God alone. And so it doesn't matter what other people say or how it's supposed to look according to the world, and that's including the church world. It only matters what God says. And God says that when a heart is truly prostrate, that when a heart is, is changed, inclined towards God, that he is quick to forgive. That when you apologize and repent of your ways and choose to forgive others to the measure that he is forgiving you, guess what happens over and over again? Forgiveness. And so, yes, this story is a beautiful example of the grace and the mercy of God on the Ninevites, on the Assyrians, that, that, that there is no distance that you can go or have lived that God cannot reach you where you are. This is a beautiful story of second chances. I love it because it says in the scripture, it says that, that God came to Jonah a second time and gave the Assyrians and Ninevites a second chance. But I hate to tell you that the point of this story is not about the Ninevites. It's not about Nineveh, it's not about the whale. The easy answer would be this is about God, and of course everything is about God. But the, the third point, and the, the true point of the story, it's Jonah. More specifically, Jonah's heart. See, here's the thing. From chapter 1, verse 1, we see the condition of Jonah's heart. God tells him, go and speak this message to these people, and Jonah's response is, no. Not because he's afraid, not because he's, he's terrified for his life, not because it's an inconvenience, but because he hates the Ninevites. His heart has become stone, and, and he has hatred towards these people. And so his thinking is, if I, if I flee the presence of God, then God will have no other option but to condemn them. And I would love to say that somewhere along the line of being in the boat and being in the fish, that he had a change of heart. But if we read the scripture in, in chapter 2, that's not what we hear. Yes, he's praying to God. He's thanking God for rescuing him in the depths of the sea with the seaweed wrapped around his head. That God sent this fish to rescue him. It's a sign of salvation. But there's no change of heart. He doesn't confess that I, I was wrong for going in the wrong direction. I was disobedient. What he says is, while others worship false gods, I worship the real God. That, that's prideful. Is that just me? Because the only reason you're inside this fish needing salvation is because of your disobedience. No, but nobody made you do this. This was the consequences of your choices. And yet you're going to sit there and still say, well, I'm the one who worships the true God, Yahweh, and everybody else is wrong, yet you're inside the fish. Do I have this correct? Your circumstances have led you to this circumstance right here where you have been swallowed whole. Now you're having to reflect on even in the midst of your disobedience, God still rescued you. But there's no repentance. It's now he's, he's vomited up on shore and, and now he's, he's reluctantly walking in to Nineveh. Prepared to share the message. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. No compassion, no empathy. He simply speaks these words out of command, compulsion by God. And, and, and this is the part that I, I want us to reflect on. So it's, it's not about the whale. It, it's not even about the Ninevites, which consumes the majority of the text. Up to chapter 3, the condition of Jonah's heart is the point of this entire story. And, and this is how it relates to you. It's, it's not about your job. 
It's not about the people in your life. It's not about the burdens on your shoulders. It's not about the expectations that people are placing on you. It's about the condition of your heart. Uh, get that among anything else. Anything else I would possibly speak, please hear these words. That God cares about what you care about. That God loves you. Cares for you. Sees you. And the priority for him, and you see this throughout the New Testament, it's not about being kind, and it's not about being generous and giving to charities and loving and trying to be and act like a Christian. And see, all those things are supposed to flow from the condition of your heart. We're doing it backwards. We're trying to emulate the actions to be good Christians and not focusing on the heart. And God repeatedly says, if you would focus on the heart, everything else will just happen. You see, you can't walk around with hatred in your heart. And here's the thing. I know some of you have been in church for like 40, 50, 60. Some of you were born in the church and you ain't left yet. Praise God. But just having membership in a church and just being really good attendees does not mean that your heart has been changed to the condition which God wants it to be. And, and, and this is what I want to challenge you with. The, the, the entire point, that's a story, the entire story, history, his story is to reflect on your heart. You see, because so many of us, and this is including me, please don't think I'm like, I'm preaching at you. Like, I got this entire download myself. The condition of your heart will always be exposed in moments of weakness. In moments of frustration and, and being tired and, and being just weary of carrying things that you're not meant to carry. The true condition of your heart will be exposed. It's why we snap at the people we love. It's why we, we have these negative thoughts towards ourselves. It's why, we, it's why we condemn ourselves. It's because the condition of our heart says we're not worthy. And here's the thing, in Jonah's heart, his, his heart is speaking, it's been exposed. The Ninevites are not worthy of a second chance. They, they're, they're, they cannot be redeemed. They don't deserve to be redeemed. This is Jonah's heart. And so, yes, I mean, this is about an entire city and revival. And this is about God using a, a fish, a whale as a miracle. Yes, these are all plots. But the point is, is God is trying to get Jonah to see that his heart has become hardened. And if you're going to be a follower of the way of Jesus, of the Father, you have to look at your heart. I almost want to say the fish is nothing but a distraction, honestly. The boat, the ride, the storm, they were distractions, something Jonah could focus on instead of looking at the condition of his heart. And that's where it gets scary because most of us enjoy the circumstances, even if we're not willing to admit it. Because if I can, if I can stay in the chaos long enough, if I can, if I can focus on the things that are happening around me, usually the consequences of my choices, I don't have to look at the real issue. That my heart has been broken, that I have hurts inside of my heart, and because of the condition of my heart, I'm hurting others. You see, if I can just stay, stay distracted long enough, I don't have to face that fact. But the very thing that God wants more than anything else, more than your time, more than your money, is your heart. That's what he wants. And what I want to encourage you with, after looking at this text and looking at these points, is that no matter where you are right now on the spectrum of this, that you might be like, like Jonah's hard hardened to everybody and, and you don't want to show forgiveness. And, and in your mind, nobody is worthy of, of true redemption, but somehow we qualify by those standards. And maybe you're on the other side of it, like you forgive everybody because you know how, how much of a wretch you were. And you are just like, I, I, you instantly forgive before you're even hurt. If that's you, praise God, pray with somebody else in the room. But see, for most of us, I want you to hear these words. That even though it feels like you are in the darkest of places, everything is going to be okay. Even though you feel like you have been overwhelmed and overtaken, because this is what Jonah was experiencing for the first time when he was in that water, and he was overtaken by the floods, and he had seaweed wrapped around him, his outside circumstances matched the inside condition of his heart. He was being choked out by darkness. He was being choked out, and, and finding himself inside the fish, he realized that everything was going to be all right. 
not because of who he was or, or, or what he has said or what he did, simply because God showed him grace and mercy. And that same grace and mercy is available for you today. No matter what you're going through, I want you to please hear these words. It's going to be all right. And what I want us to do is I want our, our worship team, including our, our young worshipers up here, they're going to lead this song over you. Let this be a declaration that no matter what you're going through, that everything's going to be okay. If you're able to stand, you can. If you want to sit, you can sit. But I want you to receive what is about to be sung over you. And in this moment of, of worship, in this moment of reflection, let God show you the things inside of your heart that he's trying to pull out. Can we do that, church? Amen. Let's worship. <laughs> 